Welcome, David Wiss here, registered dietitian, founder of Nutrition and Recovery. Today we're going to talk about nutrition during childhood and adolescence. This is of course a hot topic and there's so many different directions to go, but I'm going to talk about food addiction a little bit. You guys know how much I'm interested in that from a research and clinical standpoint. The big question is, why do nutrition and exercise interventions for children in schools pretty much always fail? right? You see reports like this, no statistically significant difference. Schools are unlikely to impact on childhood obesity, etc. Other researchers have done web-based interventions and found that uh, they're usually unsuccessful. So what's going on here? So this big question emerged in recent years. What if there was an addiction to highly pleasurable foods. So this particular study did a qualitative analysis, and I'm going to read one of the quotes from a 14-year-old girl. It's like a drug. What used to satisfy you before now has no effect. I feel like I've become immune to the foods that used to comfort me. And like drugs, you keep moving on to bigger, worse things in order to get the same feeling as when you started out. So what we're essentially talking about is um, hedonic eating or eating in the absence of hunger. So we're seeing this in children, you know, as, as young as four, uh, much earlier, but it's been documented uh, that children are eating in the absence of hunger and not just some, but the majority. Now children learn how to eat uh, to reduce negative emotions uh, very early. This particular study of 91 uh, boys and girls with a mean age of 6.8 years shows that these behaviors develop during certain critical periods. Now, what it all leads to is loss of control eating in the adolescent period, 12 to 20 years. This was a large study of over 1,600 adolescents, and it actually shows that loss of control eating is quite common. And of course, it's a predictive characteristic of eating disorders. So the question is, is does this come from, from diet culture, from dieting behavior, or is this you know, linked to overall levels of self-control that can be determined both genetically as well as um, you know, through social factors, early education, access to resources, etc. Uh, this one study showed that children with lower self-control demonstrated heightened susceptibility to unhealthy foods, but children with higher did not. Makes sense. So this big question about food addiction persists, and they actually did a study very recently in the renowned Appetite Journal that showed when they pulled the sugar-sweetened beverages from adolescents, they reported cravings and headache and decreased motivation, contentment, ability to concentrate, and decreased overall well-being. study was providing some evidence that withdrawal symptoms and increased sugar-sweetened beverages cravings uh, during cessation is uh, quite common in overweight and obese adolescents. The big topic is the first thousand days. This is where you're seeing a lot of literature. What we do in the first thousand days really makes a difference, not just what the mother does, but what the father does. So this study recommended the, you know, 10 things that are commonly suggested about exclusive breastfeeding, respecting the child's appetite, getting the right kinds of fat. And I, I actually really appreciated this study because it talked about sleep. It turns out short sleep duration may be associated with increased risk of both childhood and adult obesity. Now, in this first thousand days, we're able to observe human beings, but we have very little neuroimaging data. Uh, this particular uh, review looked at all the different neuroimaging in that early life period and really just made the point that nutrition is critical during early brain maturation. Now, I just included this to show you how seemingly vague neuroimaging studies can be. In, in, in the lab, they're able to see it much closer, but the point is we have to take neuroimaging and converge it what with what we know from rodent studies and then from psychological literature to make sense out of all these different brain structures. And it's a really hot topic related to uh, obesity as well as eating disorders, things that I'm certainly interested in. So food addiction also has to do with parental food addiction, obviously. But the question is, is it genetic 
or is it socially determined, etc.? Not surprisingly, in this study, children with higher food addiction symptoms had parents with higher food addiction scores. Um, and, you know, obviously the food environment matters, right? What parents are eating affects what kids are eating. But the, the direction of causality is less clear, right? What about restrictive eating, dietary restraint, etc.? But pregnancy is also a really hot topic. This study showed that higher sugar-sweetened beverages during the second trimester of pregnancy was associated with greater adiposity in mid-childhood. So we recently did a review that looked at all the animal data suggesting that maternal exposure to either high sugar or high fat or both can actually provoke neurobehavioral alterations in the offspring. In other words, uh, rodents that were fed extreme diets during pregnancy had offspring that were more susceptible to both drug addiction as well as food addiction behaviors. So, you know, what do we do with this ultra-processed food environment? We know that putting kids on diets doesn't work. We know that, um, you know, really basic uh, interventions in schools don't really work. Uh, addiction like eating might be the explanatory mechanism. It's the most plausible. Now, I do want to state that my opinion is that this isn't an individual problem that needs to be stigmatized. It's a societal problem that needs to be addressed at the public health level. Other thoughts are that the use of food to regulate mood starts early. Loss of control eating is common during adolescence. The first thousand days are critical, but it probably starts sooner. I'm talking about in utero and parental genes. Of course, the food environment and other social factors are always critical in order to understand this big picture problem. Do you have questions, comments? If so, leave them below. I'd love to hear from you.